Welcome. Um, you're here for the left agenda for crime and security, so this is your chance if you're in the wrong place to move, but hopefully not. Um, brilliant to have you with us. We have got an exceptional panel this afternoon in this slot uh, with Sarah Jones MP, Councillor Dora Dixon File, Dame Vera Baird KC. Kate Green and Rick Muir. More on each of the panellists before they speak. Um, but thank you for being here. I'm Sarah Hyde. Um, I've been here all day, so sorry if you've already seen me. Um, I did think about putting a wig on, but I'll just, just be myself. <laughs> I'll be myself. And in my day job, I am doing a PhD around prisons and used to work in prisons, and this is a topic I'm really passionate about, so I'm delighted that the Fabians have a whole panel on crime security, because quite often we get shuttled down the bottom in some home affairs debate and everyone forgets about this topic. And I think it has massive um, consequences and um, in, will have a huge impact if only we could get it right. And we've obviously seen that very clearly with what's been going on with the Metropolitan Police of late, um, not to mention the absolute state of access to justice in the courts and what is happening, the terrible kind of dereliction, really, that's happening in our prisons, their absolute failure to deliver anything, let alone rehabilitation and healed lives and hope. So, can't wait to hear what this brilliant panel have got to say this afternoon, and we're going to kick off with the MP for Croydon Central, Sarah Jones, who is the Shadow Minister for Policing and the Fire Service. Round of applause as we welcome Sarah, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real joy to be here, and thanks to the Fabians for putting on today. Um, I hope anyone who came by car wore their seatbelt, um, <laughs> clunk, click with every trip. It's not complicated. Um, never trust the Conservatives with our public services, Rachel Reeves said to us this morning. And I don't think that there's anywhere that that is more true than in policing. 24 hours to save the NHS. That's what we'll say at an election time, and never has that been more true. But I also think that perhaps for the first time, it won't be an overstatement to say 24 hours to save policing. We're really at crisis point, both in terms of resources, in terms of results, and in terms of com confidence. So resources, we all know about the 20,000 police that the, the government stripped away and are, are rushing to replace. But 50% of all our PCSOs are gone wasn't a policy decision, it's just the impact of austerity. PCSOs brought in by the last Labour government 20 years ago, there was a difficult sell to the police service at the time, they didn't want them, but now they're seen as the gold standard in terms of neighbourhood policing. Tens of thousands of police staff, gone. And what did they do? Vetting. What did they do? Training. What did they do? Uh, detective work, forensics, data analysts, all the things that are so crucial to go alongside our police officers to tackle crime. Police technology, absolute a creaking point. They've been designing a new 999 emergency service for years. It is going to be 10 years over, overdue and it's going to be £5 billion pounds over budget. And police really struggle not having any tools to do the precision policing that we all want to see. And what has the impact been in terms of results? The number of arrests has halved. The number of rape cases that go to court, 1.5% of all rapes that are recorded, let alone those that are not. 99.9% .9 of fraud written off, unsolved. A million uh, thefts last year written off because they couldn't be tackled. A raft of crimes effectively decriminalised. And the effect on confidence, well, twice as many people say they never see the police. So that has a huge impact on your expectations of what they can do. Thousands of victims walk away from their own cases, either because they are uh, uh, taking such an incredibly long time to get to court or because of the way they've been treated. And this week we have been rocked, have we not, by another case of um, horrific, sickening criminality um, and on a horrendous scale from a serving police officer. And this combination of a complete failure on police standards and a complete failure to solve crimes leads to this further failure. The government has presided over a breakdown in trust in policing and its victims of crime, 25,000 a day, who pay the price. Criminal complacency from a government that used to claim to be the party of law and order. Well, not anymore. Labour is the party of law and order now. Mm -hmm. Labour will restore the centuries-old contract 
that lies at the heart of our society, policing by consent. We will legislate to mandate national standards on vetting, misconduct and training, and we don't rule out more radical reform. We'll put victims at the heart of our agenda and for the first time treat violence against women and girls as the epidemic that it is. We'll put 13,000 more police in our neighbourhoods, funded by savings from procurement and collaboration, part of a modern neighbourhood team, linked to council offices, mental health, equipped with up-to-date data and technology because policing starts first and foremost with what is local. Mm. Strong communities are safe communities. Labour will be tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. <laughs> We've set out our intent already. Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, made some announcements at last conference about youth workers in our custody suites and in our mental health uh, and in our uh, uh, hospitals and uh, mentors in our pupil referral units. But there will be more to come. Watch this space. And finally, Labour will be an active government. We will stop at nothing using precision data to drive down fraud, theft, serious violence and child exploitation. Security is the foundation on which all other opportunities are built and security will be the foundation on which the next Labour government delivers for the people of this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some really, uh, yeah, lots to get our teeth into there. So thanks for kicking us off, Sarah. And I look forward to um, the question and answer session shortly. Brilliant. So moving from the national to the local, we're going to hear next from Councillor Dora dixon file who is a councillor in Southwark um, and Cabinet Member for Community Safety in that, in that borough. Thank you very much indeed. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to come here today. Um, my first problem, I have to say, though, is that I've only been given four minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> that's going to be a bit of a uh, canter through my points I want to make. Um, so um, I've been asked to talk about um, uh, the left's agenda for crime and security. And uh, as I said, I mean, as a councillor in Southwark for mm, about 25 years now, I think, um, slightly, maybe slightly longer, um, the whole, the whole picture has really changed in terms of working with the police. Um, some of you um, in the room will remember back in the day when the police were called the police force. Do you remember? And then that got changed to the police service. And so many other things have changed. So when I was thinking about uh, today and moving forward with all what we have read about in the press uh, uh, this week and um, what's been going the last last few few years actually to be honest with you um, where do we start and I think we ought to start really at the basic with the basics um, at the root of the problem and I think that um, some of the people who are in the police at the moment lots of very decent hard-working uh, police officers but I think that um, the police service needs to look at how they recruit, um, the change, the um, the um, checks they make on people who apply to work in the police force, and also at the at the people that are actually accepted into the into the police service, um, and also for me is what do we need the police service for? Um, you know, we, we, we've heard that, um, that the police, that we, we, we are all policed by consent. Absolutely right. But then we need to actually understand what does that mean? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? Um, and to be honest, for me, I want to be treated with respect, um, with dignity. Um, you know, I want to be treated as equal as the next person. Um, and I want... Um, to be actually um, respected for, for, for who I am. We all do, but so, so what's happened in the past and uh, happening now, I'm afraid, leaves a lot to be desired. So, um, I just want to also just add the fact that um, in places like Southwark, um, Lewisham, Lambeth, um, and we share, Lambeth and Southwark share um, a borough command unit, um, we need to have people in the, in the police service who actually reflect the community that they serve. 
um, again, I remember back when they used to say, well, police officers should not be um, living in the same area that they are actually being asked to work in. I think that is just so out of date, so ridiculous. Um, in Southwark, we um, obviously, Sarah's spoken about the, the lack of um, funding, but in Southwark, we've actually invested in more um, community wardens. And the people you look who are working for us, they actually reflect the community. They live in the community. They are highly visible um, in our shopping centres, Rye Lane in Peckham, you know, Camberwell, Elephant and Castle. They're actually highly visible and they know their patch. Um, I was out with a police um, a community warden the other week and the officer knew the people who were sleeping rough. He was able to call them by name and actually say, you know, you know what are you doing? You, you had a, a place, what's happening? And actually take an interest. And the person, uh, the, the lady who was um, sleeping rough and begging, she actually said, yes, yes, I know. And, and they engage in a proper conversation. And I think that's what we need to have that kind of relationship with our police officers. Um, some of you who, who are counsellors here know, oh, I knew this would happen, one minute, <laughs> one minute to go, um, who are counsellors will know that um, we have tenants associations. And I'm afraid, again, when I first began as a counsellor, I used to see police officers at the meetings and they'd listen to the, 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 the complaints, you know, um, people who are breaking into um, um, flats, etc. People know, the community know who's doing what, but it's, mm. it's how do they pass that information on and they feel scared they need to be reassured so um, I'll just leave it at that because I've got more to say about violence against women and girls we've had a fantastic campaign um, just recently um, to try and um, um, tackle misogyny from our point of view as a local authority but we need to be able to work in partnership with the, uh, uh, the, the police and we need to be doing a lot more together and I think that is some way that we can go towards actually addressing the problems that we are having. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing some of that um, kind of local knowledge, information and, and stories to this panel this afternoon. I'm going to move on now to hear from Dame Vera Baird. Case, must say KC, not QC. KC now, King's Council, who was the Victims Commissioner for England and Wales until last year, and prior to that was the um, trailblazing, if I may say, Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria, doing some excellent work in the kind of area of um, reduction of perpetration of violence against women and girls, the focus on perpetrators. Very um, pioneering work, so thank you. And prior to that, you were a Labour MP in the Blair and Brown government. So, Vera Baird. Thank you very much. Resisting the opportunity to talk for 23 hours about the Metropolitan Police <laughs> and the other hour about the iniquities of Dominic Raab, um, let me talk very quickly about victims and say, firstly, 80% of victims of crime never go near the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and they need good victim support services for all their specialist needs. And in particular, you know, crime is quite like bullying. Uh, women, BME, disabled people suffer more crime and their specialist services are the ones that are thinnest on the ground after all of these years uh, of Tory rule. It needs to be coordinated so that people get the immediate services from victim support type services they need, but then it has to be integrated with the statutory services, health and, and so on, and none of that really happens. So believe this or believe it not, there are still some people who were abused in Rotherham who have not yet had counselling treatment uh, for, uh, to, to help with it. What is a, a surprise is that victims who are given a lot of sympathy in the public sphere and are a very important piece of political leverage are treated extremely badly when mm. they do go into the criminal justice system. Um, they go backwards if they have got good victim services and started to recover. If they go into the criminal justice system, they regress. It is partly because it's adversarial, which means the state, and not them at all, is the prosecutor, 
And so this person's prosecuting him, this one's defending him, this judge is seeing he gets a fair trial, and this jury is saying, is this guy guilty or not guilty? And the victim is an afterthought. Mm -hmm. What they want is really straightforward. Good information, you know, is the guy being arrested? Uh, am I going to meet him in Tesco down the road or is he in custody 300 miles away? They want to be treated, they want to be kept up to date, they want to understand the criminal justice system and they want to be treated as decent citizens. They have just been let down by us because they have become victims of crime. Everyone feels somewhere on a continuum of, of demeaned, and damaged for life by being a victim of crime and they have to be restored and the criminal justice system is our representative to restore them to the respect that they've had robbed from them by a criminal. What essentially victims want is what is in the victim's code which we devised in 2004 when we were last in government. It set that up and also set the victims commissioner up to try to police it. It has really straightforward rights such as if I am a victim I should have the right to go through a, a separate entrance and not wait in the same waiting room as the man who ran my kid down in a drunken stupor when he was uh, in a car and we can't, you know, they are not written as rights, there is no leverage to make them work and here is the really I think damning statistic. 28% of victims who've been into the criminal justice system as a victim have never heard of the victim's code. Mm -hmm. And so they're simply not being delivered. And let's just look at a couple of statistics. I mean, we're talking about people, not statistics. But in 0910, Ministry of Justice statistics showed that of victims who'd given evidence, 67% a lot would do it again. In 2016, CPS statistics, so not the same package of statistics, but seven years later, 53% would do it again. In 2021, my office as Victims Commissioner did it, and it was 49% of victims who'd ever been near the criminal justice system who would go there again. And so we are not going to have a workable criminal justice system for much longer until we take notice of this cohort of people who want to help, feel they've got a duty to help, are looking for some justice and are treated with a terribly dismissive um, approach. What we have to do is deliver two kinds of justice. One is, and this is not a fight between victims and defendants whatsoever. I'm a defence lawyer by trade. You have to deliver forensic justice to the defendant and you have to deliver procedural justice, decent treatment that restores people as victims back to feeling that they are a valued member of society again. A plan to do exactly that looks quite simple to me. It contrasts with the weak, flimsy victim's bill that has been published uh, this week mm -hmm. and we can score some very very strong points for our people by attacking that bill but that kind of very simple strategy can redress the balance for a lot of people and let's face it many many victims of crime are our people because crime's mm -hmm. rampant in in poorer societies this is something that labor must do and mm -hmm. i'm very confident will mm -hmm. thank you Thank you so much. Great to um, hear such strong ideas about um, core territory, because I think we can be afraid of this as difficult for Labour, but you make the very good point that it was our victim's code and there's much more still to do. Handing over now to, um, once upon a time, Fabian Chair. Kate, back, back in the day. It was, yeah, the halcyon days under Kate Green's <laughs> excellent chairwomanship. Uh, Kate, obviously, is a very well known as a former MP for Stratford and Ermston and has very recently begun an exciting new role as a Deputy Mayor in Manchester for Policing and Crime. And we're delighted to have you with us today, Kate, brand new in that role and to hear your wisdom th this afternoon. Well, I've only been doing the job for a little under two weeks, mm -hmm. so I may not have developed a huge amount of wisdom yet. Uh, but what I certainly have had the chance to develop very quickly in the early days in the role is a real impression 
of where we find ourselves in Greater Manchester and some of the things that says to me about strengths in policing and the approach to tackling crime in our communities that need to be core to Labour's offer. And it's exactly the stuff that Sarah was talking about a few moments ago. So Greater Manchester Police, as many of you will know, was in special measures. Uh, our service was so poor, our inability to answer phones, attend incidents, arrest anyone or solve crimes uh, led to a very, very poor inspection report and putting the um, force into special measures in 2020, from which we only emerged in October this year. And uh, that emerging um, as the fastest improving police force in the country, and we are pleased about that, has come with a new chief constable and senior leadership team whose message is really simple. It's get the basics right, because that's what the public wanted. They wanted us to pick up the phone when they rang 999 or 101. They wanted us to come out, not tomorrow or next week or not at all, when they reported a burglary to us. They wanted us to be there um, solving the problems in their local communities, knowing when the guys were dealing drugs around the corner, when the kids weren't in school, and we weren't doing any of that. So we have absolutely focused on putting those basics right. Um, and alongside that, and again, this touches on something Sarah was talking about, a big commitment to neighborhood policing. Now, we have to manage some expectations around that. We don't really mean the old fashioned Bobby on the beat giving you a clip round the ear, there's one on every corner, because we haven't got the numbers for that. And modern crime and modern expectations are very different. And a lot of crime um, is of course going on behind closed doors online in the home. We see it as a problem-solving approach to policing, about identifying the key issues that are affecting crime and security and safety in local communities and ring-fencing, protecting police resources to be part of the, um, the, the, the system in those communities, not being moved off because there's an emergency down the road and we've got to rush them off to response, but actually protecting the resource for neighbourhood policing so that they can really become core players in their communities, identify the key issues that are causing um, people's feelings of fear, insecurity and unease in their communities and begin to plan um, strategies and interventions to address them. And this isn't about being soft on crime, it isn't about um, the soft, cuddly, touchy-feely approach um, that I'm sure our um, critics would wish to um, denigrate us with. It's sitting alongside effective and swift policing. It's sitting alongside an increase in Greater Manchester in stop and search, an increase in Greater Manchester in arrests, but I'm also pleased to say a reduction in the number of complaints that we've been getting because people can see that communities feel safer and stronger as a result. Now, one of the things that's helped us for quite a long time in Greater Manchester, though, in recognising the drivers of criminal behaviour and of people being drawn into crime, particularly young people, um, is, of course, the um, ability within a devolved government setting where we can bring together different players in the Greater Manchester family um, to bear down on some of the social determinants and drivers of crime. So we first saw this in Greater Manchester uh, with um, the whole system approach to women, something that I think was enormously successful for us, uh, bringing together um, all the different agencies that could support women uh, who were offending or at risk of offending or previously had offended, including the justice agencies, probation, the prison service, through the gate work, but also bringing to bear um, housing, mental health, uh, family support, uh, community support and employment support, putting those different elements together to wrap around a total package of support for women offenders uh, and those who were at risk of becoming involved in crime. And I think there's a huge opportunity now with Gordon Brown's work on a, a big devolution settlement uh, for the country for us to be very, very clear about what we intend in this space in government. And our whole system approach for women in Greater Manchester is something that we can now spread out to all offenders. And we're able to do that in part because of the justice devolution settlement that we've been able to secure from the government, which now gives us um, access to um, the ability to bring in our probation service, work with our CPS uh, and our prisons, as well as um, the wider um, public service and voluntary sector community, really, again, to look at a holistic picture of supporting and addressing those needs that um, 
can lead and engage people in criminal behaviour. The final thing I just wanted to say very quickly, Sarah, is we speak at a time when public trust in the police, and not just the Met, is of course really very, very low, particularly low among women and girls, particularly low too among certain minority ethnic groups, and I would probably particularly highlight in Greater Manchester the African Caribbean community who have very little trust in the police, and without that trust, how can we say that policing is being done by consent? So we have to invest in that public trust, but that also means investing in our police officers, and as Sarah said, after many years of cuts, a police uplift programme is now about getting us back to where we started in 2010, uh, and we're looking forward to welcoming many new police officers into Greater Manchester this year and next. But we have to invest in those officers and in officers already serving, many of whom are planning to leave within the next two years because they are so unhappy about the pay, the conditions, the workload and the attitude that they say government has to the police. So I think it's very important that we show our willingness to invest in our police officers, support them in their expectation of pay that respects the efforts and dangers that they face, conditions that are manageable and enable them to balance their professional and personal lives, and gives them the respect and dignity that says that they are here to protect us and we value that. They don't feel they're getting it from the government. It's absolutely vital that the message that they hear from Labour is that we will give them that respect. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And delighted to hear somebody on the panel speak about the holistic whole systems approach that involves local authorities, that involves the health service, that involves housing as much as uh, the police. So thank you so much for that, Kate. Um, finally, before we go to our question and answer session, we're going to hear from Rick Muir, who is the director of the Police Foundation. Um, in which he's done since 2015. And prior to that, you may know him. Previous hits include IPPR's Associate Director for Public Service Reform, as well as being a councillor in both Hackney and Oxford. Thank you, Rick. Th thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, and thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm going to talk... We've only got four minutes, but I'm going to talk about um, what Labour's approach should be to reforming the police. Um, and I think there are basically three challenges which, um, which need to be addressed. Um, the first thing is um, we need to get really serious about preventing crime and harm. So we talk about um, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And the, the challenge is that um, we've never really got um, serious about crime prevention uh, in, a, in a major way. Um, and I think the police need to be part. Um, the police are essentially a reactive institution. They sort of deal with, th they deal with bad things that have happened already. Um, but they play a role, I think, in trying to get a more preventive um, system. And at the local level, I think that is about whole system thinking, actually. It's about the police being part of a redesign of local public services, so they're more focused on, focused on intervening early, they're more focused on trying to make sure that things don't get into crisis uh, situations and that crime and harm are, are prevented first. So there's a big job there linked to the devolution agenda about the role of the police collaborating much more deeply with health, with education, with local authorities and others um, to prevent crime uh, and harm taking place in the first place. Um, the police within that system need, I think, to take a prevention first approach. Um, as I say, mainly the approach at the moment is reacting um, to stuff uh, and dealing with it and responding to it, dealing with crime that's already happened. Um, but police officers, they can't do the job of youth workers, they can't do the job of social workers, nor should they. But they should approach the incidents that they attend with a preventive mindset. What can I do as a police officer to, to stop this thing happening again? Why is this young person coming into custody again? And what are the actions that I can take to try to, um, to, try to prevent that? And so that needs to run through the way in which our police are trained, the way in which they see their role. They can't just see their role as being about charging people with criminal offences and sending them through the criminal justice system. It has to shift into that much more preventive uh, way. So that's the first thing on prevention. Secondly, we need to do something about the drop in trust, uh, and, co trust and confidence in the police, as Kate was 
uh, uh, describing. Um, and I think there are two elements to that. One is repairing the relationship between the police and communities, and one is dealing with the internal issues within the police service. So in terms of repairing the relationship with communities, um, the commitment that um, Sarah and uh, Yvette have made around neighbourhood policing is really welcome. And the, the evidence on this is really clear. Public confidence in the police rose when the Labour government at the time in the mid-2000s invested in neighbourhood policing, and public confidence in the police has fallen as neighbourhood policing has been eviscerated because of austerity. Uh, and it's, uh, that's correlation rather than causation, but I, I think it's really clear. Um, you see in the charts the number of people who say they saw a police officer in their local community in the last month. As that declines, public confidence in the police declines. So there's a really strong connection between neighbourhood policing policing um, and public confidence. So that needs to be dealt with because at the moment, neighborhood policing is seen as a marginal extra in policing. You know, policing is basically about responding to 999s, investigating crime. Um, neighborhood policing is a marginal extra. It's fairly low status. You know, a lot of police officers don't want to do it. Um, we need to change that. Um, we need to make it the foundation of what policing is all about. Um, we also need to look at reforming um, the use of police powers. I think particularly the most controversial is always the use of stop and search. Um, the police should use stop and search less, um, and they should do it differently. Um, they use it far too much. I think there's an argument for saying they're, they're a bit addicted to the use of stop and search. They see it as almost like the default mechanism for dealing with uh, violent crime, even though the evidence shows that it's not particularly effective um, and causes great concern in communities. So we need to address, the power is important. Of course the police should have the power to stop someone if they suspect they're carrying an illegal item. Um, but it needs to be used properly with respect to people and use less. Um, and addressing the internal challenges within the police then, um, and I'll close on this because I've just got a, a minute left. Um, uh, there's clearly some big internal cultural challenges within policing in terms of, we've seen it with the horrendous Carrot case, we saw it with the Cousins case, we've seen it um, in, a, in a number of cases uh, recently. Of course, the misconduct system needs to be reformed. Um, it is absurd and Kafka-esque that chief constables cannot remove bad police officers from their police forces. I mean, what an absurd situation. You know, the public expect these people to be able to get a grip of this situation. They cannot get rid of bad police officers. They need to be able to do so. Um, vetting needs to be improved, obviously. Um, but key to this as well is frontline su supervision. Um, the sergeant rank is the most important rank in policing, and yet the learning and development and training and support they get to be good leaders is very minimal. They, they, they pass an exam and basically it's kind of, they're kind of left to it after that. Um, they need to be the people who are setting an example. They need to be the people who are saying, if someone makes a, 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 an inappropriate comment, you, know, you shouldn't be saying that. That's not, that's not what a good police officer looks like. They need to be setting the example. And at the moment, we're not giving them the support that they need to be the leaders that they uh, need to be in the future. And finally, I would just say that um, the police service needs a significant modernization if it's going to tackle the challenges of the 21st century. We talked about fraud. 60% of crime in the crime survey is now just uh, fraud and computer misuse offenses. Crimes that didn't really exist in the same way as they, they do today, 20 years ago. Um, you're not going to do that through local policing. Um, you know, we have an org a police, the police service is organized pretty much in the same way as it was in the 1960s. Um, we need to reform the structure and the way it's organized, and, and that means, I think, particularly more national capability to deal with um, uh, serious and organized crime, and a reskilling of the police workforce. We're obsessed with officer numbers, you know, recruit more officers. Uh, nobody asked the question, what do we want them to do? <laughs> what problems do we want them to solve, and what skills do they need to do it? That's now where uh, the agenda needs to shift to, and you know, I'm optimistic that under a Labour government we'll be able to do that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for those excellent and diverse contributions. Uh, we'll now take a few rounds of questions from the floor. We'll take them in rounds of three. And uh, yeah, pithy with a question mark at the end. That's my new thing. And there's a person here with a hand up in a kind of brown fleece with a blue scarf. Uh, we're talking about the causes of crime. Um, I live in Oxford. The educational attainment in the schools in Oxford is very low. Um, and I think that follows through. The, the, the people who are coming out of the schools 
with very minimal qualifications of probably some of the people who are then ending up in our prisons. So I think we ought to be starting further back and, and really look at, at um, why so many children are coming out of school with little qualification. Okay, I will t what's your name, sorry? Oh, oh sorry, yeah. It's all right. Um, uh, Biddy Hudson. Biddy, lovely. We'll ask someone on the panel a bit more about that. Wonderful. Other... Sorry, yeah, and the blue shirt and the jacket. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Uh, Julian Eccles from Hammersmith, um, where uh, for a few years I was a volunteer visitor at Worm and Scrubs Prison, uh, which is almost literally one of the shittiest places on the planet. Um, and it's interesting we've had five contributions from the panel. I don't think I heard the word prisoners or prison reform uh, once. This despite the fact that recidivism rates are running at something like 75% of uh, inmates uh, re-offend within nine years or so. What can we do about that? What are we going to do about prison reform? The mantra is normally that there are no votes in prisoners, prison reform, etc. Can we just get a grip on this and uh, do something about it? Thank you. Thank you for that excellent question. I might be slightly biased. Um, great to hear a question about prisons. Um, wonderful. And there's a gentleman down here in the blue striped jumper. Sorry, but we need more people with microphones. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just want to make an observation as someone who used to um, work in the police. I think one of the most damaging uh, periods of time for the police was between 2010 and 2012. Um, when the Conservative Mayor of London and the Conservative Government imposed austerity on the police service and sold, uh, one of the first things they did, they sold the jewels and the crown, which were our police stations in our communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, one of the police stations that I used to work for, for example, um, is now a popular pizza restaurant and luxury flats. Um, and I think one of the greatest policies that I've heard from, from Labour that the next Labour Government will bring about is new policing community hubs in every community, which will mm -hmm. mean that it, it puts bobbies back on the beat and it just means police officers having to travel lesser distances to reach people and I think it will really drive confidence back into local policing. Okay, I think I know your name so I'll cheat on that one. Right, okay, so we've kind of got... Um I'm going to, there's something around what we're we doing around the connection between uh, educational attainment or lack thereof and that, that roots into crime and how we're tackling the causes of crime. A more direct question, what we're we doing about prisons? And then from Milad, uh, just highlighting that the, the closure of police stations was really devastating and uh, advocating for police community hubs. I guess maybe, Sarah, I'll come to you first for some, some reflections on the final point. Okay, on the final one or the about the police community hubs okay police community hubs yes thank you very uh, it is a good policy i mean i think it's been uh, in croydon where i am there used to be um uh, quite a large number of police stations there's now only one it's bad from the perspective that you talked about in terms of community um uh, kind of impact and people feeling safe and and knowing that their police are, are nearby it's also really inefficient uh, so if you have fewer custody suites fewer um, police stations you end up i was in berwick the other day it takes an hour and a half to drive to the nearest I mean, it's relatively rural, so that we'll give them some slack for that, but it takes an hour and a half to get to the custody suite. So if you're one of just a couple of officers on duty on Berwick High Street and something kicks off, you have to take a decision. Do I arrest these people and remove them? But that will remove myself for the rest of my shift. And is that a decision that, I, um, you know, that I'm able to make? So it has a huge impact. And uh, Labour's um, idea of community hubs, not necessarily reopening the old police stations, um, some of which were kind of inefficient and old, and but to put police officers alongside enforcement officers with a local council, mental health officers, we're looking a lot, and Yvette is talking a lot to where streeting about that connection between mental health um, and uh, policing, because police spend a lot of their time dealing with mental health issues and not dealing with crime, and they're the, totally the wrong people to be doing that because they're not qualified, um, and uh, they do it anyway because they, they have to, um, but, but having police at the heart of our communities, it's good for tackling crime, it's good for efficiency, and it's good for community relations. Thanks. Rick, did you want to offer anything on the policing hubs? Um, no, just to say, I mean, I think that I, I, I think it's a good policy. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I wouldn't reopen a lot of the old buildings because there's a lot of, as you'll know, work and there's a lot of police buildings that are pretty bloody horrible places, to be honest. So, um, but I think, so I think looking at new ways of trying to, to um, embed that is a, is a, is a, is a good idea. Um, 
Uh, and I, I just wanted to, on Julian's point about prison reform, I thought that was, um, I completely agree. I mean, it's absolutely necessary and needed. Um, uh, and I think there's an argument for saying, I, I think Kate said about, um, the, the, talking about devolving, devolving probation in Greater Manchester so that there's more local control over the probation system, which I think is really important. I actually think more local control over the prison system might also be a beneficial thing because one of the problems of the prison system is um, it's, it, it's a kind of... Um, uh, people go to prison... Um, all the levers for stopping people from going to prison are held locally, but the, you know, the, the, the prison places are paid for nationally. Well, actually, devolving some of that to the local level, so that, um, which they've done in America in a number of places, so that there's actually a, you can get a virtuous cycle where um, local authorities and others are incentivized to try to reduce the prison population because they have to pay for it, right? Um, now, that would be big and bold, and it would be difficult because um, there aren't prison, prisons aren't, equitably located neatly in each part of the country. But I do think we could experiment with some of that about mm. um, devolving more of the prison system. I think we'd start to get a bit more thinking about reducing reoffending and, mm. um, uh, and integrating prisons with local public services in a much more effective way. Yeah, great. And if I may stop incarcerating so many people that really need to be in a secure psychiatric unit because the maths of the situation. Um, thank you. Slightly chip in this chair. Um, brilliant people down this and I don't know, would you like to say, Kate, talk to that educational entertainment, the kind of holistic piece about the causes? Yeah, um, it's a really good point. And of course, it's going to become even more critical, Biddy, because we can see the differential impact of the pandemic has been that children from more disadvantaged backgrounds have suffered even greater learning loss. Um, and uh, both against their peers. And then if you look at poorer uh, parts of the country, we were just looking at the figures in Greater Manchester as our children in Young People's Board yesterday. And the gap between Greater Manchester and their peers in other wealthier parts of the country has also widened. And one of the things that I think we have to unpick is how is this connection um, manifesting itself in terms of the, um, the, the read across to crime? Um, and there are a number of things that I think we can say. One is that um, those children who are repeatedly excluded from school are much, much more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. And so I think we have to have a very um, close look at what we're doing around exclusions. That re you know, that's a, a, a discussion that needs to take place between Sarah and Yvette uh, and Bridget and the shadow education team. How can we actually keep children in school uh, as much as we possibly can? I think we've got to have a big investment in the early years because that is where we are seeing the beginnings of educational inequality and the gap already widening. I think we've got to pay attention to speech, language and communication skills, which have suffered massively during the pandemic and which have a very, very clear correlation with uh, people in our criminal justice system. I mean, you really see it in our prisons, actually, the very, very high levels of poor speech, language and communication skills. Uh, and I think we've also got to recognise, for example, children and young people with autism are much more likely to fall foul of the criminal justice system. And so I think there's a very, and young people with learning disabilities as well, in mm -hmm. fact. Uh, and so I think there's a very important piece of work for us to do with our education system about how we are protecting, developing, and then policing around those children and young people. Um, so I, I think it goes back to the point I've been making earlier that, you know, a whole system approach that you can really only do meaningfully at local level has to be at the heart of the way that we think about children and young people's route into, or preferably not into, uh, the criminal justice system. And I do think it's a much more pressing question for us even than ever before now uh, because of the dis disproportionate effects of the pandemic. Great. Fair. Um, yeah, I agree with everything Kate said about uh, Biddy's question. I agree with, with Kate, but I, I, and I would just add that care leavers mm. also are a particularly vulnerable community who do get support and who quite, quite readily, uh, more than average, do devolve into criminality at some stage. Really, a sort of lack of hope, I think, is playing a key role there. And we have to add that there is a, a big racial imbalance between kids who are excluded who are not from school, and that fundamentally must be tackled. I wondered if I could just comment on Julian and say that although nobody mentioned it, it's never far away, I think, from what we're thinking about. As Victims Commissioner, I became very clear 
that quite contrary to the way that the job can be seen, it isn't, you know, us on one side and defendants mm. on the other. To be quite frank, and I'm sure you're aware of this, there is a terrific overlap mm. between who is a victim and who is a, 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 a defendant. I mean, I expressly mention women who are victims of sexual abuse or of domestic abuse. More than 65% of women currently in custody are victims either of earlier sexual abuse or quite often of contemporaneous domestic abuse, suggesting that they only committed what might be survival crime or alternatively delivering his drugs because they're under his control and they end up in custody when the problem is what we should have sorted out when they were victims, which is to tackle the domestic abuse that's causing it. And that is not a case over here because there is an enormous amount of poor impacts on people, particularly young people, which ends them up in the position where they start to commit crime. Uh, I would want to say one, uh, I think, you know, positive possibility, and that is this, the, the youth justice scheme, the youth justice board in particular, but the yachts and referral orders and so on, have had a powerful impact on reducing young people going into criminality and particularly going into custody. And yet that system ends very arbitrarily mm. as someone gets to 17. Yeah. There is abundant research and it's been with us mm. for a decade to say that actually young people don't fully develop until they're 25 mm. or more. They certainly mm. don't understand fully the consequences of what they are uh, doing uh, criminal foresight is simply not there until they mature to that age and I am very sure that one thing we should consider is to extend the youth justice system so that it goes to a much higher age and quite a lot of uh, people in prison of the kind that you're concerned about are between those ages of 18 and 25 indeed it is the most common mm. age for young men in particular to end up in custody. I think you're absolutely right, you know, and there is a lot of thinking going on about that within the Labour Party now. Thank you. And Dora, did you want to come on the education yes, attainment please. point? Yes, thank Thanks. you. Um, just wanted just to throw out there, um, I think it, it's also about the relationship that uh, young people have with the police. Um, coming from an area, South London, a lot of deprivation. Um, it's very easy for the young well, not easy it, it's it's young people seeing the police as not on their team shall we say mm. um you know as um as people that they would don't want to relate to what we've done in in southwark is um we have a few um, youth clubs and we've invited uh police officers to come along and actually work with the young people um to show them that you know they are on the same side, basically, you know, to show them, you know, if you're stopped by an, an officer, this is what you should do, this is what would be helpful, and, and things like that. We have um, a fantastic um, theatre called The Blue Elephant, and again, they do that similar kind of work to try and encourage the, our young people to see the police as part of their team. Mm. And also, can I just say that about the, um, um, we've got um, now lots of uh, police um, officers who want to actually um, engage with our young uh, offenders and they have sort of football matches and they have um, they go to the, the, the youth clubs etc and they try to build a relationship and I think if that can be done and encouraged then you are talking about actually encouraging young people to actually um, not see the police as their enemy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm very aware of the time so I'm just going to take two um, the person down here in the roll neck and the jacket and then is there. Thank you. And uh, it's Jonathan Hinder. I was a police inspector until uh, last year. Um, just wanted to echo what you said at the start, Sarah, about um, so happy to have this session and to see it in the main hall is, is great, which sort of leads on to my question. Uh, it's actually a more political one, um, which is whether you think the left's discomfort or squeamishness, if you like, around this particular topic is stopping us landing the blows on the Conservatives that we might, given their appalling record over the last 13 years. Thank you. And then just 
there was uh, the lady in the pink scarf. And then I'm going to ask, we're only going to take two questions, and then I'm going to, if you have anything final to say as well as answering this, you're going to get a minute each panellist, so that, that's your warning. Yes. Rosalind Morton from, <coughs> from Thanet. I just would like to know more, please, about the, um, the funding streams for the <laughs> reforms that you've outlined. Thanks, Rosalind. That's a great question. <laughs> and we know that, that we are very good these days at working out where the money's going to come from before we offer a policy. So excellent contemporary question. Right, um, I'm gonna, just going to start at this end and, <laughs> and work our way down. Um, you're going to have about a minute each if you want to answer either Jonathan or Rosalind's question or offer any closing remarks, please, Rick. Um, yeah, well, I mean, actually, coming back to Jonathan's point, I mean, I don't, I don't think there should be any squeamishness. I mean, I think that um, actually, um, as Vera was saying earlier, you know, it, the poorest people in society suffer the most from crime. Uh, this is an issue which the left should care about. Um, the right to live safely and securely, uh, you know, is as important as the right to health and education and all the rest of it. So, um, so it's something that we should be passionate about. It's something that we should be um, uh, pushing forward with. Um, and let's face it, you know, the government is in a in a, in a difficult position on this because it's um, yes, it's increasing the the number of police officers now, but only taking it back to what it was when they started. Um, and we've had massive reductions in police staff. You look across the, the police service, uh, almost any part of it is overburdened and, uh, and under-resourced at the moment. So um, the criminal justice system we were talking about is in a parlous state, I mean, an appalling state, what's going on in prisons and so on. So wherever you look, there are significant problems. So I think um, there should be no squeamishness on this at all. I mean, there should be a positive argument for saying we can um, redesign, rebuild um, a, a system which is, um, which is currently on its knees. Um, and, um, and I think um, we can be very confident about doing that. Okay, thanks so much. Brilliant. Dora. Um, yes, I just want to agree. Um, there should be no squeamishness. I mean, because everybody, whatever their status in life, we all want to live peacefully. We all want to be, feel safe. You know, so there should be no problems at all. What is, what is actually holding us back? I think it's the question we should be asking. What's actually holding back some parts of society in not engaging totally? I think that's the question for me. Can I just say before I pass on, I can just acknowledge my um, um, assembly member in the audience, Marina, from uh, Lambeth and Southwark. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sarah, and please do address Rosalind's point also. Uh, funding, yes. So, as you know, Rachel Reeves is particularly uh, strict about making sure that everything we announce is costed and funded, um, quite rightly. Uh, so, the, the, the biggest um, expense that we have announced is the 13,000 extra police in our communities. That is a mix of new officers, some uh, reassigned existing officers, some PCSOs and some specials. Uh, and it is funded from a big programme of work around efficiency savings. So the Police Foundation, I think, I can't remember what your figure was on yeah. the savings that could be made, but it was it was large. Yeah. We were much more uh, conservative when we worked out ours because you have to be with Rachel. Um, so ours is actually relatively conservative. There's probably a lot more savings to be made, but every police force has its own uniform every police force has its own uh, uh, police cars now operational independence is absolutely crucial in policing but operational independence is not uh, what car am I going to get my men and women to drive what 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 uh, you know uniforms am I going to use what IT system am I going to try and procure from people that I don't really know when they're trying to fleece me operational independence is am I going to send my force in to, to stop that protest or not that's operational independence and that's what the government's trying to take away so so we have been really clear on our funding there is loads of savings to be made I think we are we are more conservative than we need to be um, and on uh, the, the point around um, uh, being squeamish about some of these issues we, we absolutely have to not be squeamish about any of these issues it is fundamentally crucial mm -hmm. that the first the first job of government is to keep people safe and I, I last year did a tour around the country looking at antisocial behaviour and it's the poorer communities that were affected yes. by far uh, the most when it came yeah. to, to just persistent pernicious antisocial behaviour that drags communities down and makes you feel bad about yourself and where you live um, and that has to be number one for, for the Labour Party. Thank you so much Vera. 
So I don't think there's any scope for squeamishness, to be honest. It's a huge job that we've got to tackle and tackle it straight uh, away. I mean, we, the, all public services have been slaughtered by this mm. government, which doesn't use them, basically, mm. and thinks they're for other people who are less valuable. And the courts and the police have fallen foul, I'm afraid, of the same approach. But it is absolutely integral in our communities living coherently together that we have good ways of tackling crime and tackling the causes mm. of crime. So it's most definitely something that ought to be a priority. And, and you know, it, raises a, it, it ranges across a lot of issues. So, I mean, it, for me, very profoundly as an equalities issue, mm. we have, you know, hopefully equality is better for women now, you know, better education, better opportunities, promotion at work, um, better pay and so on. If a woman is raped or sexual abuse, that's it. You know, for a foreseeable future, her career is interrupted and she is very badly hurt and will take a lot of rebuilding. So all of the effort we put in, you know, all of the attempts we have to try and produce an equal society can be fouled up very readily by out of control crime. I just wanted to make one tiny point. Rick's made, made a really good point about the need for the police to be repaired as it were in two ways. One, public confidence and two, their internal problems which are in my view massive mm. and very difficult to repair without in external mm. oversight, mm. indeed intrusive yeah. um, external mm. involvement. But it is uh, I think pretty well known that community policing does not only help to restore public confidence in policing, but it also somewhat splits that appalling loyalty that police otherwise have to this hierarchical command structured we're brothers side mm -hmm. by side because it gives them a level of loyalty to the community they live in day after day after day. So it has a whole lot uh, of possibilities and we do need to restore that as fast as we possibly can. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, Kate Green. So the funding challenge is huge. For 2023-24 in Greater Manchester, we will receive an uplift in our police grant from central government of 1.8%. To that, we will add, we hope, we're consulting on it now, an increase in the precept that will bring up the total increase in funding for 2023-24 to 3.5%. You'll be well aware that inflation is around 10%. We are having to meet the same energy price rises. We are having to meet the same cost pressures as any other public service, any other business, any other household. Uh, and we are being significantly underfunded to do that. Um, and police pay is far from keeping pace uh, with inflation in common with other public services. Of course, the difference being that the police cannot strike, uh, and that is in part contributing to this real concern we have about retention and the number of officers indicating that they are more likely than not to leave the force within the next two years. So the funding pressures are very significant. We can and we will look for efficiencies, and I very much agree with what Sarah has said about looking at how forces collectively could work more efficiently. We don't need 42 different HR systems necessarily or 42 uh, different telephone systems. We can also look cross service. So in Greater Manchester, we can look at how we can have efficiencies across health, transport, fire and rescue, police, and that is work that we are going, uh, that we have underway in Greater Manchester. Um, with the benefit of the devolution arrangements that we have mm. now. Uh, and we are going to have to do that because there is no doubt that these funding pressures are not mm. going away. But the fundamental way in which we can make the police more cost effective and more effective goes back to what I was saying uh, at the start. It is about a prevention model. It is about mm. a problem solving model. It is about getting ahead of the increase mm. in crime. And that, that's, that's always been true, but it's never been more true than it is now. Uh, and that's why I, I think that the, the work that we're trying to do in Greater Manchester, the neighborhood police and commitment this area is making is so important strategically. And then finally to Jonathan, very nice to see you. Um, on the squeamishness. Well, we don't need to be squeamish as far as talking to the public is concerned. The public have no confidence in the Conservative government's ability mm. to keep them safe. They can see the criminal justice system is failing them. They know police officers don't turn up. They know the courts have backlogs of years, not months. Uh, they know um, that their prisons are full to bursting. Um, we don't have to convince the public that Labour can do a better job. If we're feeling squeamish internally, 
get over it. We have great policies, we have real commitment, we believe in public service, and the police service is one of the public services that is of most importance to the public, and we should be proud to stand up for it and to proclaim that we are going to ensure that we have a police force fit for the 21st century, um, something that the Conservative government have absolutely not delivered, and the public know it. Thank you so much. Round of applause for our excellent panel. Thank you so much for the thought-provoking questions, and long may um, the next Labour government's pursuit of equality, absolutely, it's an equalities issue, and social justice be absolutely at the front and centre, because these are our communities and our people, as we've heard from the panellists, that are suffering most. So thank you for your time being here this afternoon. Um, back here in 10 minutes for the international address from Pedro Silva Pereira, MEP, um, should that appeal to you, and then followed by Policy Dragon's Den. So grab another cup of tea, stretch your legs, but back in here in 10 minutes for the next session. Thank you so much.